Now, you all, today is a very special day. I am having a conversation with, I guess, a very special friend of mine. Goes back 40 years. He and I were at IBM together. His name is John Floyd. John was an Air Force captain. He and I were with IBM some 40 years ago. He was a systems engineer with IBM. And after retirement with them, and actually before retirement with IBM, he started writing short stories. And those of you who know him know what a delightful person he is and what incredible work he puts out. So I thought I, I've been trying to get, him, get together with him for oh, some time now so that we could have a conversation. I don't call them interviews anymore. I don't like the idea about an interview. It's too stilted. and I like to have a conversation with folks. Well, John and I just had a conversation uh, planned for today, and it'll take place shortly in the studio. But I'm in my outside studio right now, and I just thought I'd introduce you from here. I want to tell you a few things about him before we get started, though, so you'll know you'll know what you're in for. And I'm going to read it because I cannot remember all of it. John, he's appeared in more than 350 different publications, his work has over 350 different publications now, including Alfred Hitchcock's Mystery Magazine, Ellery Queen's Mystery Magazine, Strand Magazine, The Saturday Evening Post, three editions of the Best American Mystery Stories, and the 2021 edition of the Best Mystery Stories of the Year. Uh, he's, he's also a, a Edgar Award finalist. I know that this doesn't mean a lot to a lot of you all, but these are very prestigious things in the writing world, particularly short story and mystery genre. genre. The 2021 Seamus Award winner, a five times Derringer Award winner, a three times Pushcart Prize nominee, and he's authored nine books. He's also the 2018 recipient of the Edward D. Hock Memorial Golden Derringer Award for Lifetime Achievement in Short Mystery Fiction. And he's got right now short stories in the current issue of Alfred Hitchcock's Mystery Magazine, The Strand Magazine, The Mystery Magazine, and this past Sunday, he won the 2022 Derringer Award for the best flash story of the year. Flash story meaning short, short story. So, you know, he's, he's no ordinary author, I can tell you. And all of these awards and all of these things, I told him he was going to have to get a bigger house with a bigger wall to be able to put all these awards up on it. But the biggest award, I think, has been in our association of somewhere near 40 years. I have never, ever heard anyone say anything derogatory about John Floyd. Now, I know a lot of people. I am blessed to know a lot of people. And I know a lot of people who know John. And I have never heard anybody say anything that was negative about this man. And after you see him today, I think you probably understand why. So, without any further ado, we're going to adjourn over to the studio and have our conversation with John Floyd. John M. Floyd, we finally get together. Thank goodness we've been trying to do this for a couple of, couple of weeks. Welcome to Richie's Roost in beautiful downtown Chaco. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm just glad to hear, man. We finally get together. Uh, Lots of water on the bridge since you and I first got together, what, 30 years ago or 35 or something. By the time you get our age, you quit worrying about it. I know. You know? Well, I just told your bride who came out with you that uh, not too long ago, I had a little minor surgery and uh, this nice young anesthesiologist came up and 
we were chatting like I usually do with most folks, and I asked him what his name was, and he said his name was Floyd, and I asked him uh, if he knew you, and he said, well, yes, sir, I do pretty well. I said, no, he's my father. I said, well, <laughs> let me tell you this, man, put a little pressure on you. I said, you need to do a good job on me on this thing, because if you don't, your dad's going to be really hacked about that. And he said, well, that's a lot of pressure, but I'll do the best I can. So he evidently did a good job, because... Uh, the next second, I woke up in the recovery room. So good. He, he's a good man, just like his dad. You know. Well, we got a lot of things to talk about this morning, man, because we've done a we've done a lot of many walk a many mile together, okay. huh? We sure have. Uh, start us out with where you from? Where your education? That kind okay. of thing. Where are you from? I'm from Silas, Mississippi, it's in Tyler County. No, exactly. Right up there by Kosciuszko. You really know where it is? I sure do. I bird hunted up there on occasion. <laughs> Matter of fact, we had somebody in IBM named Joe Salas, if you recall. I don't. I didn't know him. Well, we did, and that's kind of where his stomping grounds were. Anyway, yeah. Uh, excuse me. I'm sorry. No, I'm bad I grew up with Salas. Grew up with Salas, and uh, we just we just had a grade school there. So I went to high school in Kosciuszko, 12 miles away. After Kosciuszko, I went to uh, to Mississippi State. That's too bad. And I, I think that's great. <laughs> and I graduated in electrical engineering, of all things. And then uh, after graduation, I, uh, I hired on with IBM here in Jackson. That's where you and I got together. It first. is. Yep. Came here, gosh, 1970 when I met you. And uh, I stayed only a couple of months because back then, well, when I was at state, I went through ROTC, Reserve Office Training Corps, for the Air Force. So I had a four-year commitment in the Air Force afterward. So I hired on with IBM and then I went off on a military leave of absence when my time came after a couple of months. And then I was gone for four years, Tinker Air Force Base out in Oklahoma City. And um, IBM was uh, kind enough to count my time that I was gone as time served. So I wound up those four years counted toward uh, IBM if I came back after four years, which I did. And while I was out in Oklahoma, I met, I met my wife, Carolyn, the best thing that ever happened to me. No question about it that. It is. And then we came back here after those four years, and I went right back to, to work, a job at IBM. And then um, went off to all, all, all these classes. Remember back then, it took about a year and a half, I guess, to train before we got going. And stayed with IBM for 30 years. Now let me interject something here for the folks that don't know. John was a systems engineer right. with IBM. Right. I was a salesman. Right. The difference was a salesman made the promises. The systems engineers were the ones who made the promises happen. <laughs> they were the smart guys. We were the bird dogs. <laughs> they were the guys that really got things to The down. way I remember it is a salesman made more money than the systems <laughs> engineer. <laughs> well, that was only fair. Y'all were just smarter than we were, so they were trying to even it up somewhat. <laughs> Okay, I'm sorry. No, that's, that, that's it. I wound up I worked for IBM for 30 years. And Lord, they were good to me. Uh, they, they were really good to me. They sent me all over the world, but they kept me based here in Jackson, which worked out great, you know, for us. And uh, and then I retired, gosh, a long time ago now from IBM. And I've been pretty much uh, pretty much worthless, you know, ever since. Yeah, yeah, worthless. That's we're going right. to talk, talk about all that worthless stuff you've been doing. Weren't you with the bank for a little while after you left IBM? After I after left IBM, yeah. uh, kind of a bridge to retirement kind of a deal. I wound up working for Deposit Guarantee, who was one of our customers for many years. Deposit Guarantee National Bank here in Jackson. And um, stayed there just a couple of years before uh, before retiring, sure enough retiring. When did you start writing? I started in the, in the early 90s. like. I'm the least, least likely person in the world to be doing this kind of thing. Because, I mean, most, a lot of writers, they, they would have an MFA uh, degree, or, or they would have majored in English in college, or they would have started writing at an early age. I didn't, I started in my 40s. And um, so I'm not really sure, gosh, I'm not really sure how I, how I got into it, but in the, in the early 90s, I was traveling still with IBM a lot. Um, I think part of it was, I was by myself a lot. I was in the car a lot. I was in airplanes, airports, hotels for conferences, those kinds of things. And I just started dreaming up these stories. And, and part of it, I believe, came from the fact I grew up in the 50s and 60s where I was watching all these 
little half hour shows on TV like Alfred Hitchcock Presents and Twilight Zone and One Step Beyond and Outer Limits and Death Valley Days. And they weren't series with the same people every week. They were different folks every, every week with different stories. Um, and they could usually be told in half an hour. And they usually had maybe some kind of a little twist ending to them. And I just loved those things. And I, I kind of grew up on them. And while I was traveling all over the place by myself, and I was, I got to thinking about these, and got to thinking about these little stories, and started writing them down. And, um, and, and after a while, the desk drawers and dresser drawers, seriously, were filling up at home with these stories. And finally, Carolyn told me, it was, this was 93, this was late 93. She said, why don't you send some of those things off and see if, you, see if someone likes them, see if you can get them published. And man, I didn't like that idea a bit because I love my stories. And I didn't want to send them off to somebody, you know, who might not like it. This fear of rejection deal is a big deal. That's a big thing, especially for beginning writers. And so I didn't want to do that. And I said, besides, I don't know how to, I don't know how to do that. And this was a year or two before we got a home computer at home, a little bit before the internet. So um, she says, well, there's a library and you, you can find out how. And, and it really is what I did. I went down and found a book called Novel and Stor Short Story Writer's Market. Big old thick thing. I think it's still published every year. What's the name of it? It's, it's Novel and Short Story Writer's Market. Hmm. And it lists hundreds of places where folks can send their unsolicited manuscripts off uh, to, for consideration by editors. And, um, and so I got that, and I got a book too on how to submit a manuscript, how to format it, how to, you know, uh, margins and all those kinds of things I didn't know anything about and told me how to do that and so with those two things I put together five of my stories and had tons of them and I put together five of my stories and sent them out and just incredibly I was just incredibly lucky because four of those five stories were accepted and published and I thought this is easy as rolling off a log I just write a zillion stories and make a zillion dollars. And uh, I think the next dozen, the next 13 or so were rejected. I mean, just almost as soon as I sent them out, <laughs> yeah. which is a lot more the way that things ought to happen. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, it, it was good because I learned that, that sure enough, it's, all this depends a lot of times on whether a certain editor likes a certain story on a certain day. I mean, good story get rejected, you know, every day. But I was lucky. I was the reason I was so lucky. I think is because I had that I had that early success. I was fortunate enough to have some early success, so I knew that at least you, it could be done. I mean, think about these folks that they'll send their stuff over and over and over for years. And those are the folks I admire is the ones that they'll send us for years and have rejected, but still stay with it. A great Gatsby, I think, was rejected like 300 times. We've all heard the stories about, you know, John Grisham's first book, all those kinds of things. And, um, and that's a fact that usually just, usually beginning writers just really have, have a lot of rejections before they have any success. So I was real, 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 real lucky there. And so I just kind of hung with it. And after a while, I told somebody a while back, um, just like with anything else except maybe golf, you get better usually the more you do something. And so I, I think I'm better. I hope I'm better at what I'm, what I'm doing now. But I still get rejections and everybody. Well, you get, every writer does. You get rejections, but I'll tell you what, you're going to have to start buying. You, well, you're going to have to buy a bigger house with a bigger wall <laughs> to hang all these awards on you've been getting. I, I've, been, I've, been, I've been fortunate. I've just been fortunate there. Because in my introduction, I did mention a bunch of them, and uh, we'll be talking about a couple of three of those, too. You have done a fantastic job. Well, let me ask you this. Now, how many short stories do you reckon you've written? Just hundreds and hundreds. Um, I've, I've had something published in in 300, I think it's 350, 360 different places, different markets, different markets. And um, a, lot of, a lot of stories, uh, around uh, a thousand. Uh, 350 different markets? Different places, right. Wow. Right. Uh, yes. If you look hard enough, and sure enough, these days, you don't have to do something like that novel in short, that writer's market deal. These days you can go on the internet and you can just say, you can just search for, for uh, for short story markets, mystery short story markets, western markets, romance markets, uh, science fiction, and just see what you get back and, tr and try those, see what the sites look like, so forth, 
and send them off. Some are big magazines, some are small, some are anthologies, which are collections of a bunch of different stories by a bunch of different authors. It seems like there are more of those now than there, than there used to be. And then once you find that, you try and send it off to say. What's up? You know, I, I'm going to ask you to speak up just a little bit, and I'm going to speak up a little bit too because okay. I was supposed to. Here's my technical prowess come to, come to light. Uh, you know me. Uh, I forgot to put our little speakers on, mm. but anyway, this usually works out okay. okay. So just in case, we may wind up doing this all over again, so we'll have twice the fun. <laughs> Maybe I can do it better next time. <laughs> okay, let's go. Excuse me, I'm sorry to interrupt. You were talking about um, all those, all those different. There are places markets. that yeah, these these folks, these writers who are just starting out, you can you can search for places to send, you know, what you come up with. And, uh, and, and, and it's just kind of an audition thing. I mean, you just send it in and see whether they like what you've done or not. And um, uh, sure enough, if you've sold them a few things, it's easier to sell them a few more, that kind of thing, it's like anything else. But uh, there are a lot of different places that you can try. Where do you think you sold most of them? Most in one particular place? Well, you laugh at this, but if you've ever been to the grocery store or Target or Walmart and look at the racks, magazine racks, there's a place called Woman's World. And it's, it's, they publish one mystery story a week and one romance story a week. It's a woman's world? It's called Woman's World. Okay. And so back in, gosh, 99, 98, I sent them stories, a mystery story. I think the first thing I sent them was a little romance, but it wasn't really a romance story. It's kind of a little, it had a lot of deception in it, that kind of thing, which I love. And they wound up, wound up buying <clears throat> a couple of my stories. And so I kept sending them to him, kept sending them to him, and I think I just sold my 123rd, 124th story to those folks. Wow. And so that's probably the place I've published the most story in any one place. And a lot of those are series stories with the same characters that just kind of got to be fun and seemed like the readers liked it, so I just kind of kept, kept doing it. That's a lot of fun. You know, it's a funny thing. Carolyn, your bride, was the one who suggested that you get this thing kicked off and started. I think she's just tired of tripping over all the stuff I was, right, all the stories. Right. I was, right. So that's how I got started too. My wife told me, I was telling her a story one day in a car right now, she said, you need to write some of these things down. And I did, and there we went. So, you know, we, we hooked up with the, wrong, with the right gals, it looks like. For uh, many reasons. Yeah, that's just one of them. <laughs> right. Okay. That's true. Okay, well, when did you decide to, put some of these in a book. Oh, well, what happened on that was I had a bunch of stories out there, and there's a guy here in Jackson named Joe Lee. Uh, he was a weathercaster for a while um, on television. And um, he's, he had, had an idea. He published several novels of his own. He published and, one of mine, too. He did, I know he did. And um, he was going to set up a little publishing company where he was going to find some authors and see if they wanted to uh, to write something and he was going to publish it. And he asked me about some of my stories that he had seen, I think in Alfred Hitchcock Mystery Magazine or someplace like that. And it sounded like a no-brainer to me. I mean, because sure enough, the stories were already done. In my case, the stories had already been written. And I was just, uh, he was, he said, why don't we put a bunch of them together and kind of see what, see what happens. And we did that with 30 of my stories that had been published and uh, the book did well and uh, it, it all sold out and it was reprinted and so forth after that. And, um, and so we did several more then after that. But that's how I got into it was it just kind of fell into my lap. Uh, I was real, real fortunate and uh, Joe's, a, Joe's a good man. Yeah, he is. He, um, well, and he set up all the interviews and stuff. Of course, since then, You've written what nine books? Uh, right, eight, and then one supposed to one supposed to be coming out before long. So uh, eight eight different books, but all of them except one are collections of short stories, and most of them are mystery short stories. I just love that kind of thing, crime short stories. Well, and you've got a twist at the end. I've often told Sometimes folks that it's, it's it's O Henry reborn. <laughs> You know, you, you've got that little twist at the end. As a matter of fact, I used one of your stories. I think I told you the other day, I used yeah. to go and talk to seventh and eighth graders down at Madison Middle School and uh, talk about writing and, and storytelling. And I always used one of your, one particular story that you told. 
that uh, has got that kind of twist at the end. Two or three different things that you assume that really don't turn out. Well, that makes so much fun. That makes them so much fun to ride when you have those now and then. Well, it, it probably makes, also shows I never grew up, but but I, but I just like that kind of well, stuff. Well, it makes a lot. It makes a lot of fun to read too. I can promise you that. <laughs> yeah, they're they're good. Ones. I just don't know where you constantly come up with all of these ideas one after another for hundreds of times. I know you think you think pretty soon that well will run dry is is the thing. But uh, but I do have a lot of a lot of ideas. You know what? That's the thing that I it probably has happened to you too at book signings. The thing you get asked, or the thing I get asked the most, is where do you get your ideas? It seems to fascinate folks. Where do all these ideas come from? And the truth is, is I'm not sure there's a good I'm not sure there's a good answer for that. Ideas are just everywhere. Well, and they and they come different 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 writers have different ways of doing that too. Yours are figments of your imagination yeah, for the yeah. most part, right? Yeah, are, yeah. Including the characters and everybody else, except one little old lady that you constantly write about. And she, you know, she's just hung in there for years. But mine were stories that <clears throat> either actually happened or parts of it actually happened and you had to kind of embellish some things, right? right? So there are different ways of coming out of short stories. You've had a more exciting life, see, than I have, and you have more experiences to pull from, right? Yeah, right. Some of them we really don't want to talk about, too. <laughs> Some of them didn't get written down, right? <laughs> That's right. Some of them shall remain, shall remain silent forever. <laughs> well, well, one time I wound up, sometimes there are little pieces of ideas you can put together, you can piece together into, you know, into a bigger one, into a bigger, better one. Uh, one time I, I went, IBM sent me to Alaska for like several weeks. And while I was up there, the guy I was with uh, taught me to go on with him. We went, uh, we went out uh, fishing out in the middle of nowhere. And he said he... Um, while we were there, he said he'd go scuba diving a lot up there, down in the Bahamas. And he said he has to be careful though, because when he goes down there, if he comes up from a dive, of course, I mean, he's been down there on vacation, he has to wait at least 24 hours before he gets in a plane to fly home. Because if he doesn't, he'll die. Hmm. The decompression stress thing, it's so deep, and then you go up in there. And um, I thought, well, that's fascinating. That is just fascinating. I think I could probably maybe use that into a, in a story or something. And um, shortly after that, IBM sent me to Manila to teach a class, the Philippines to teach a class for two weeks. And in doing that, I crossed over the international date line. So I either lost a day or gained a day going and coming, I forget. But, but I thought, I wonder if I could put those two things, things together. After I got home, I wrote a story. As soon as I got home on my trip, I wrote a story, putting both those little ideas together and sold it to Alfred Hitchcock Mystery Magazine. So really, I ought to charge any trip I make or any that kind of thing. That ought to be research. That ought to be probably, you know, put on my taxes. Right? All these things you get from other people, you hear from other people, the things you see and you learn. Good luck. With <laughs> right. That. Right. Good luck with that Ex idea. Good luck explaining it, right? Well, I'll tell you something you probably didn't know. You say you've written hundreds and hundreds of stories, right? I just, I've got a book, one of my favorite books over there is The Complete Short Stories of Mark Twain. You know how many he wrote? How many? 60. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's a little better known though than I am for some well, ways. Yeah, well, you're working on it, I can guarantee you that. <laughs> <clears throat> Have you ever, in all this short story business you've been doing, had the desire to write a novel or a book? Yeah, I, I did, more to just kind of see if I could, you know, could do it. Uh, I've written like three and a half novels. Um, the first two are out with an agent, He's excited about them, but I'm not sure anybody else is. He, he's sending them out and so forth. He's had a couple of bites, a couple, a couple of nibbles, and uh, said that uh, we really could do better than that. I'm wondering whether I'm going to be a little bit like the guy in high school. You know, his friends are going to set him up with, with a great date, like, you know, for the prom. And, um, and they're trying so hard that he, he, he's probably going to wind up, you know, sitting at home <laughs> that night. But those two were fun to write. It's a whole different. It's a whole different process, though. I think my heart's really with the little short stuff. With novels, you live with those characters. You live with them day in and day out for months and maybe years. Martin Hegg would tell you this, a friend of ours. And um, and you got to really like them. I mean, you're you're they're in your head all the time, right? Maybe I get tired of them too fast. I don't know, but I really like the the, the idea that I can come up with. I can come up with something, I can write it, I can write the end after a few days, and then I can go on and the next day write something completely different, something completely different subject, different people. 
that's just fantastic. I just love that. It's just kind of a freedom, I think, that you get. Maybe maybe it's a sense of completion. I've done that. I can forget it, do something else, that kind of thing. Um, and so I think, I don't know the shorts. It's just something about those little short stories I just love. How much do you re rewrite or polish a story when you get through it? I really kind of, I, I do a good bit of that. Um, most of my time, everybody works different, Jim. Everybody's, you know, everybody's different, you know this. But uh, the way I do it is I think about it a lot first before I ever start writing anything down. And I get it all mapped out in my head first. So I guess I'm a, I'm a plotter, I'm a, um, an outliner, I guess, even though they're, it's a mental outline mostly it's in my head instead on paper. But uh, I think through it all and then I start writing it down. The writing goes fast and I can write the whole story then. And then the rewriting takes another takes another few days because I think I'm one of these folks who likes to write it all down, get it all down, no matter how bad it is. I, I kind of live in fear that one of these days, you know, I'm gonna get hit by a truck. Folks are gonna find these half written stories and think this guy doesn't really don't know what in the world he's doing. No. But I write it down no matter how bad it looks, and then I kind of and kind of whip it into shape. And I, I do a lot of that. Folks who don't, there, there's, there, there are an awful lot of people who will say that anytime you outline something like that, novel, short story, anything, you think it through all, all the way to the end, let's say, it takes away from their creativity. It, 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 it takes the fun out of it for them. So they just start right. They're called pantsers. See, they're called both, you see know, where it of the seat of the pants, see, see where it goes. And, um, and I admire folks who can do that. I can't, I can't do that, but I admire folks who can do that. If I did that, if I just started out just started writing, had no idea where I was going, I'd waste a ton of time. I, I think Tony Hilleman, the, the, the writer, said one time that if you're a fiction writer uh, and you don't outline, you better hope you live a really long life because you're gonna, you're gonna waste some time. You're gonna take some false turns and so forth. So I think it saves time. I think I've, to, to map it out first in your head and then write, and if it changes while you're doing it, that's fine. If a better thing comes up, I do this fan. But I got to have that little safety net there first before I, before I start. Well, you you remember Lewis Grizzard? Yep. He said it one time, and and I guess I'm more like that than than, than the way you do it. He said, "I write the story, and when I get through with it, I'm through with it." I really? Mean, that, usually, the first draft goes, and I can't do that now. I can't do that. Yeah. I, I can't. I can't imagine. I can't imagine doing. If, I guess he edits as he goes. I like make the first page as good as it can be, and then he goes to the second page and makes it good as it can be. If I did that and things change later on, let's say in my story, I'd have to go back and I'd have to rework, you know, all that. So I admire people who can do that. I, I wouldn't be able to do that. Uh, I, I don't either, and use a, and, uh, what's the, uh, oh, the, the word book. <laughs> The, the big old thick book with words that have no plot, right? right. <laughs> the oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, dictionary. Well, so you have actually written two books then that are out, and and another one sort of completed, right? Is well, that what you told me? Oh, well, and they're not they're not out there through, and they're with the agent, but they've not been published. Well, that's they're what I mean. Sold. They're out out in the public. Right, right, right. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Have you ever considered? Well, let me let me pre precede that question with, have you had any interest from movie people on some of the short stories? Three or four stories have attracted the interest of some movie folks. Uh, the best the best opportunity that I had there was uh, was one where I, I got an email from a, a Hollywood producer and uh, it went to my spam folder. All the good emails are gonna go to your spam folder so you need to be sure to check it every day, right? But it, it was an email from uh, from a production company there, and they were interested in an Alfred Hitchcock story that I had written several years ago, and thought that would make a good movie. And wanted to ask about the rights to the stories. And when, you know, when my heart started beating again, you know, just, I was really pretty thrilled. I got him in touch with my with, with an agent because I had an agent then for, for the novel. This was just a couple years ago, and um, and he contacted him, and then for five months they negotiated. Did I tell you about this? Mm -mm. And that they negotiated the thing for five months, back and forth, back and forth. And uh, they, would, they would email my, um, my agent on the, on the East Coast would email the folks out on, on, on the West Coast, the, the guy in LA and his lawyer, the producer and his lawyer. And then they'd email back and back and forth. And then uh, agent, my agent would 
copy me on all those emails. And the emails would say things like, um, I, went and became, I mean, that's too much money. Can't, can't do that much. And then the agent would say, well, you're going to have to do that much. And then they're back and forth and back and forth. And I, th and I thought, Lord, this is going to go right down the toilet, you know, before anything. And so finally, I just stopped reading. The, I just stopped reading. When he copied me, but I just went <laughs> reading. Y'all handle it. Right. Finally, they did. They did come to an agreement. Um, uh, I got paid. It was an option. With, with, with the movie deals, what happens is, and I had no idea about all this, is that um, they buy options on the, the, the manuscript, and that just assures them the first chance to do something with it. Nobody else can buy it in the meantime while they're, while they're working on it. So that option then can be renewed after a certain period of time, a year, year and a half. I think in our, in our case, it was a year and a half. And so they pay you for the option. And then uh, if they're still working on it, hadn't been done, hadn't been produced, they might renew that option or they might drop the whole thing. Well, they did renew that uh, about a year or so ago. And um, it had twice the cost of what they, uh, the first option, which was a good thing, the agent set up. Uh, and it, right now, nothing's, Nothing more. I haven't heard anything in a long time, which usually means things are probably dead. But we'll just we'll, we'll see. Uh, that's the one I think that has been the most most promising. The plan there uh, would be to for it to be the pilot in a streaming series, uh, which you see a lot of now, Black Mirror and some of those that are out. But we'd say we'll have to see, you know, what happens whether anything happens with that. But the beauty of it is the story's already been written. It's sitting there. You got to gather and dust, and if somebody expresses interest in that, I mean that's a great, that's a great thing. The same thing happens sometimes with uh, with foreign rights. Somebody will want to reprint a story overseas. That's another place where it really is fortunate for me that I had an agent to ask because I knew nothing about all those kinds of things. How did you come about getting this this agent? Where did you meet him, and how did that work out? What happened was. Um, Gosh, I mean, I had, I had an agent early on, had one agent early on who saw some of my stories, contacted me, wanted to see about representing me. And I didn't know what I was doing. It just started out. And so I did, um, I sent him some stuff. wanted to see some of my stuff. I sent it to him and he said, I'd like to represent you. And I was with him about two or three years. He was elderly and passed away in, gosh, 1990, I guess, and uh, up in the Northeast. And he got me into some places, I think got me some opportunities I wouldn't know or, uh, otherwise have gotten. But there's just not much money for an agent in short stories because short story writers don't make much money. And they get a percentage, so there's not so many people who do that. But it was good for me, my education, uh, just how all this stuff works. And, um, and so that was, how, that was how that came about. And then later on, uh, this agent was, uh, again, it was just somebody I'd, I'd heard about. Um, contacted me, asked him to be interested, and, uh, and, and we hit it off, and he looked at some of my stuff and wanted to, wanted to represent me. But um, you don't really need an agent for short stories. You really don't, because there is not much money in it. Hard to find one. Uh, you can make more money on your own because there's no percentage if you don't have an agent. But for these goofy things that come up, like foreign sales, movie deals, and so forth, it's really nice to have one to be able to to help you, because if somebody came, to a, if somebody had come to me with a movie deal, and I hadn't had him to fall back on, I'd probably said, "Great, so it's me. You can have it for free." You know, so I mean, what do I know? Yeah. So that that works out works out better there. Well, let me ask you this: If let, let's let's uh, say they come back and they say, "John, we we've decided to go ahead and make a movie of this story." Right. 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 We would like. For you to do the screenplay, right? Would you be interested in doing that? I have been told by about by dozens of writers to not touch that, to don't do that. Let them have it, sell it, get the money, and that then it's their deal, and they can do what they want to with it. Uh, I do know some writer, Greg Isles, wrote the screenplay for uh, the only I think the only book that he has had a movie made of. And he wrote the screenplay, and he said it was it was a hard it was a hard day it was a hard job to do something like that. And of course, there's extra there's money involved with that, and I guess there's a pride too involved if that if that works. Uh, but boy, I've heard that's a task because the folks who wind up sometimes the movies and the and the, and the stories don't look you know this don't look the same. I've I've heard it's best if you're fortunate enough for something like that to happen to just say hey uh, just just pay me and do what you want to with it. Well, that. 
you know, remember Tom Clancy used to get really upset because those movies weren't, you know, to his you know, level of, of perfection on particular details, and it just threw him for a loop. But, you know, if you sell it and say it's yours and walk I, away, then... I don't think it would worry me a bit, whatever they did with it, but... Yeah, well... <laughs> um, oh, you mentioned to me something the other day when we were talking that there is a Russian publisher. Yeah. Or should I even talk about it? No, that? no, that's fine. It's, that's, that's the one that's supposed to be coming out. That's supposed to come out before long. It's going to be called Selected Stories by John Floyd. Um, I was contacted again by, by email uh, from a lady in Moscow, Moscow, and it was, uh, it was a publishing company there. And they had seen some of my stories in the Saturday Evening Post, in the print edition of the Saturday Evening Post. Uh, the Post comes out with with one story every two months in their in their magazine. And I've had 10 of those. And um, and they liked my stories and wanted to do a bilingual edition of those stories where there would be my story in English and then side by side it would be in Russian. And so it would be not only an entertainment deal but an educational deal that they could uh, market that way. And uh, again, that, that I sent them to my agent and he took over that and, uh, and we were paid for the rights to, to do that, for them to do that. And then uh, all of a sudden things have changed here lately. And so I wonder whether, I've been told that, that it's not going through, but I would imagine that's probably not going to make Well, what are the so, complications for doing something like that as far as, do you have to, you know, get a, get an okay from the State Department or, you know, any of that kind of stuff to deal with those folks? That's why you have the agent and that, anything like that he takes care of, all that kind of thing. Um, is everything done in the agent's name so you don't have to worry about that? It really is. That's, it's almost like your CPA covering you on taxes when, you know, you, you let them take care of that. That's part of what, the, and that's why they get paid uh, a percentage of, of what you uh, what you make. Okay. No, we'll see how that goes. No danger of having a knock on your door saying, what is this deal? Uh, yeah, I problem. think I think Carolyn's worried about that right now. Well. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think they're going to come after me. You think that you don't think they're going to come after you? I don't think so. We'll see, we'll see what happens with the book. Uh, it's just the relations are so, are so with Russia are so bad everywhere right now. I'm just not sure something like this is going to happen. But um, then we'll see what happens. We'll see. Okay. Well, all right. Let me ask you one one last thing. And you talked about writing, and we've talked about a lot of things, but. And you mentioned that you were teaching classes for IBM all over the world. So, but you, you've done a lot of teaching here at Millsaps for one place, right? And I have. Uh, Millsaps College, uh, I wound up teaching for 17 years, night classes there on fiction writing. For 17 and, years? Yeah, for a long time. It was, I think, starting in 01 or so. Um, and, uh, and then stopped in 18. And those these were night classes. It was continuing education. It was... Um, community enrichment program of theirs. The beautiful thing about that, I think 600 students went through those classes of mine. They had a great time, really had a lot of fun. A lot of folks who you knew went through those, those classes. And um, it, it, was, it, was, it was an awful lot of fun, I think for me, and I hope for, for the students too. It was, it was called Writing and, Writing and Selling Short, it was really an original name. It was Writing and Selling Short Stories. Part one and writing and selling short story part two, and that's that, throughout the time. Those I taught those two classes, and um, it just involved the students would turn in stories. I would critique them. We'd talk about uh, how to make them better and so forth. And so the writing side of it, and then the marketing side would just be to try to help them find places to to sell their stories. Which is there's not a lot of there's not a lot of ways to find that out. You can get on the internet and play around, but some of it's just trial and error. And so I just tried to tell them about some of the holes I'd fallen into as an author and try to keep them out of them as far as selling your stories, because it's just really a lot of fun to get. I have a story in uh, uh, Alfred Hitchcock Mystery Magazine this month, this May June issue, and boy, those are a lot of fun to write. And when when you do that and you wind up hearing from folks you haven't seen in a long time because these things are national magazines and they'll contact you and it's just fun to do that. How do you, do you like signings? I like the, yeah, I like, the, I like meeting the folks at the signings. I do like that. 
it's something that you almost have to do. If yeah, if you if you have a, if you have a book, you almost need to get out and do some of that. And I have with just about all of them. Uh, the signings are fun. Yeah. Well, the last signing I went to one of yours there. You know, there was a line there, which is kind of nice. Well, I, which, was, I was fortunate. Uh, which is, you know, Irma Bombeck, who died way too early. <laughs> right. Did you did you see the story about her first book signing? She said that she said the two thing two people came only two people came and one of them one of them uh, I think asked directions to the restroom and the other one wanted to know how much she wanted for the table. Yeah, the desk. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> hey, that could be more true. That could be more true. Than I have know. been there. <laughs> oh, I think all of us have. Yeah, and so you just got to have a tough skin say next time. Right? I know, but it's fun. It's fun meeting. Fun. It's fun anytime you meet somebody who really kind of wants to wants to read what you created is is a lot of fun. And mm -hmm. uh, and especially when you have folks well like you who came back to who uh, who came to sign. Again, you've been to some before, and you came to another one. That's a, that, that's a nice thing when that happens. <laughs> well, you know, you get a lot. Of, you meet a lot of folks too. Yeah. You know, and make a lot of friends. Well, let me ask you this: as one last thing, you're a rosy cheek young uh, would be writer, uh, and I'm looking for some old gray hair advice from yeah. somebody. And so I've started writing these little stories, or I've started writing this book. What do you? What kind of a attitude do you think I should take and where where should I go and what should I do? What you should the main thing to remember, I think, I don't know if I was told this or not, but it makes sense, is don't let rejection bother you because that's just gonna happen. And I know so many people who give up, you know, because nobody likes to be told their baby's ugly. And 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 uh, sometimes you need that. You need folks to to tell you that. But it makes you better and you try just try try to keep keep going but don't let it get you down you gotta you gotta persist and you gotta keep trying in order to do this and it's probably the best advice i think you could give a young a young writer uh try to use every resource you have get on the internet lord knows it's so so easy now to find out these kinds of things compared to the way it used to be and to create the stories too with the computer where we used to have to type you know type uh, manuscripts. In the first couple of years that I did this, I, 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 I did this. So I could see that part of it. It's so much easier now to do it that way. But just keep at it would be the thing. Have you ever looked into the possibility, you know, as it is now, there are tons of publishers out there on the internet about publishing it yourself. Right. What, what kind of advice would you give kids for that? Well, I've never done that. I've never self-published anything. So I'm a bad one to ask. Uh, I think that's a good option for a lot of folks. Uh, I myself would prefer to try the traditional way first um, because maybe because I'm lazy. I mean, I don't want to do the business end of it. I want to do the writing and let everybody else do the other. Somebody else do the other part of it, okay? Uh, but the advantage of self-publishing, probably the biggest advantage is you keep all your money. You know, you don't get royalties or you don't get percentage. You get... Um, you get to keep you get to keep everything. Yeah, well, unless you sell it to a bookstore or something. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Then you'd have to pay them for yeah. for the, the signings uh, for the uh, for the sales that you make there. But yeah, self publishing is self publishing doesn't have the stigma that it used to have. You know, so I think it's uh, it's it's a lot more attractive to folks than it used to be. Yeah. I, I got started the other way, and I guess I'll probably continue that way now. Well, you're gonna have a bunch of folks watching this, uh, Mr. Floyd. So is there any further thing you'd like to say, any piece of advice you'd like to give or just anything that's on your mind you think that maybe we may have left out this morning? Oh, gosh, I don't know if we've left anything out. I wanna thank you for the chance to do this. It's always fun to talk about writing. An old friend of ours, Ben Douglas, told me once that anytime he gets a telephone call, no matter what he's doing, if it's somebody who wants to talk about writing, he talks to him because it's just fun, it's fun to do. And, uh, and this, has been, this has been a lot of fun for me. I appreciate it a lot. Well, man, I'm delighted to see you. Glad you're out here. Thank so you, until next time, sir, thank you very much for coming and we will uh, catch you on the rebound. Thanks, sir. So I'm back out here in my outdoor studio after our conversation with John Floyd and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. He's a good man. Now, next week, we're going to do things a little bit differently. You know, we're living in some really interesting times. 
And instead of having a conversation next week, I thought I'd give you maybe some, some thoughts shared by folks that we know and a lot of people that we don't that go back years and years. It'll be hopefully interesting for you. And then after next week, we've got another one coming up that I know you'll love. Um, I'm, I, I'm just, I'm excited about what we're doing. And let me ask you to please, if you would, hit the subscribe button down there and let's make sure you don't miss any. We got some really interesting things coming up and I hope you'll, I hope you'll join us. But until then, I'm Jim Ritchie. I'll see you again next time.